May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to thee, O oh God, my rock and my redeemer. This Sunday, we want to explore the gift of creation. I wonder if you remember the first time, those of you who are city dwellers like myself, the first time you were taken outside the city, the first time you went to camp or to a small town down south. Do you remember looking up and saying, wow, I didn't know there were so many stars. Do you remember being amazed at all the brightness and how many stars that you couldn't really notice in the city? In fact, my favorite memory of my grandmother was her making me stop and notice nature. Did you see the stars, she would say? Did you see the moon last night? And then she would ask, if we drew that, what colors would we need? It was wonderful to have an adult in my life that was continually pointing me to the beauty of creation here in the big city. That's the awe and wonder that David has when he looks up in the night sky. There's something about a night sky with a big moon and shining stars that can create a sense of wonder, or like Debbie said, majesty, if we would just stop and notice. In the Old Testament, David noticed, although he knew very little about astronomy, but as a shepherd sleeping outside, he spent a lot of time under the starry skies. And he knew just by observing the stars that something larger than himself, something outside of himself, had to orchestrate this glory. Don't you find it strange today that people actually want to debate whether or not to take the Bible as a book of faith that refutes science? Many people have the bias that suggests that science is in conflict with theology. I, I don't understand the confusion, especially when we talk about creation. Because I understand science to be nothing more than a study of what God has done and the masterful mechanics of it all. Combining science and technology is not new. For centuries, many of the great scientists were men and women of faith, for example, although his views were a little unorthodox. Isaac Newton saw God as essential to the existence of space. He said, gravity explains the motions of the planets, but it cannot explain who set the planets in motion. Sir Francis Bacon viewed science as a way to learn deeper truths about God. And Copernicus, who placed the sun at the center of the universe, would shatter the debate about whether the earth was the center of the universe. Was a person of faith? Well, while scientists laughed at Copernicus, the church took him very seriously. Why? Because the church of his day understood that science was getting it right about God and humanity and our place in the universe. The earth is not the center of all creation and humanity is not the center of the universe. Even now, we want to be a big deal of the universe. Rick Warren in his book, The Purpose Driven Life, says in the very first chapter, you are not the center of the universe. And for many people, when they read that, it is a revelation. <laughs> in today's psalm, humankind is authorized to have dominion over all other creatures. But this doesn't mean that we are the center of the universe. This psalm is trying to tell us, yes, we are recipients of God's honor and glory, but we are not the most important thing in all that is. 
although we play a key role in how creation is ordered. Just think about it. When you look up on a starry night, you are looking at what has been before you, what is here now with you, and what will be here when you're gone. That's exactly the kind of revelation that David was having as a shepherd in the fields. He would be out at night looking at the sky and without the street lights that we have, he could see all the stars. And he was moved. He was inspired. He writes, when I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place. What are people that you are mindful of them? And, and David, he knew nothing compared to what we know about the universe. He didn't know about galaxies. In fact, they thought in space there was absolutely nothing. And now we know there are whole galaxies. Now we know there are billions of stars. Which means that the universe is so much bigger than we could ever imagine. And that means that God who made the universe, or as Bishop Shelby Spahn says, the ground of all being, is much bigger than we could ever imagine. But it also means we are smaller than we thought. <laughs> I mean, we're nothing in this vast universe. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, O oh Lord, what are people that you are mindful of them? Yeah, we're much smaller than we thought. And you know what? We don't like being diminished. We like to be the center of everything. But the more we learn about the universe, sometimes the smaller we feel. And we feel small, and sometimes we feel like nobodies. And we hate that. I mean, at our job sometimes this feeling of being a nobody can be magnified. Or uh, there's a party or an event and you're not invited. You're left out. Nobody. Our children don't call. Our parents make plans without us. And we feel left out. We're nobody. It's the end of the year and our boss piles more and more work on us. I don't do that. <laughs> Without a word of thanks or appreciation, again, be treated like a nobody. And so it's so easy to just feel insignificant, like you're a nobody. And if God is that big, do we fade into insignificance by comparison? But here's the thing. While we are so small in comparison, we are made in the image and likeness of God. But see, that's where the problem comes in. Like a child that covers their insecurity with bravado, we take the power of that agency we do have and so often become, as the Bible says, puffed up. And we have to help. We are not insignificant. We are big and bold and bad. We think about all the great things human beings have achieved over the years. We think about all the great advances we've made, the improvements to the quality of life, to health and education. And when we think about all that, our egos take center stage egos. I like the idea that ego stands for edging God out. <laughs> because when we only focus on our triumph over nature and never focus on living in harmony with it, 
That's exactly what we've done. Edge got out. And I don't have to tell you what has resulted. The damage we've done to the environment, the pain and suffering we continue to inflict upon one another, all the ways we misuse power, the way we give in to corruption and to allow injustice to go unpunished. So if we concentrate entirely on human advances, we miss the bigger picture. And we make humanity the center of the universe. So that's what's so great about this song. David doesn't make that mistake. He begins and ends with a praise of God who made the heavens and the earth and everything in them. Even though the majority of the psalm is taken up with the discussion of humanity, it's clearly God who is central. For it is God who has made us and not we ourselves. It is God whose image we reflect in the service we do. So yes, the universe may be enormous, and God may be more magnificent than we could ever imagine, and we may be nothing but a grain, a, a grain of sand in all creation. But the good news is God is so great and God is so powerful and God is so magnificent that she is able to care even about us. You see, when we think of ourselves as nothing more than a grain of sand in a vast universe. It's easy to think, well, why would God care about us? After all, it's hard for us to care about a single grain of sand. I mean, so many of us find it hard to care about a single human being, not of our tribe or clan. How can God? We're thankful that God is so much greater than we are. Yes. And God is more loving than we are. Yes. And God cares about us. As small as we may be in this vast universe, God cares about us. So when this young shepherd, David, looked up to the night sky, he saw God's creation and marveled and then wondered, what am I in this vast universe, God, that you would care about me? Despite our seeming insignificance, don't forget, we are made in the image of God. So let's think again about what that might mean. I believe it means that we were made for creativity. We can birth new things into being. It means we're made for responsibility and we have been given the ability to make choices. Choices. To make decisions, particularly moral decisions. And just as God said, let there be a dome in the midst of the waters, and just as God said, let there be light, and just as God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures, we can say, let there be peace. We can say, let us study war no more. We can say, let there be harmony and community. We can say, let us all live within the household of God. Being made a little lower than God, but crowned with glory, means that we're not omnipresent like God, but we have the capacity to overcome our physical limitations. We explore the earth, we dive into the depths of the sea, we probe space, we build things that make us walk, fly, float, and cruise. It means that although we're not omniscient, we do have an 
insatiable thirst for knowledge. It means that although we're not omnipotent, we do seek power with a passion and in the process have unlocked some of nature's greatest secrets. We are far from perfect. Yet at the same time, we desire and work for perfection. That's what it means to be in the image and likeness of God. We're not God. But we have so many things that kind of look like her. <laughs> and God has given us dominion over this world. What a huge responsibility. Scripture says God has given us dominion and put all things under our feet, all sheep and oxen and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the air and the fish of the sea. And how we have misused that responsibility. We're meant to be servants of the earth, the stewards who care for God's creation. But humanity has turned service into enslavement and care into exploitation. And as a result, the world suffers. Listen to what happens to the land of Israel as a result of the curse brought about by its people's disobedience. Reading from Isaiah, the earth dries up and withers, the world languishes and withers. The heavens languish together with the earth. The earth lies polluted under its inhabitants, for they have transgressed laws, violated the statutes, broken the everlasting covenant. Therefore a curse devours the earth, and its inhabitants suffer for their guilt. The earth is utterly broken. The earth is torn asunder. The earth is violently shaken. And when we look at the fires and the earthquakes and the storms this day, the earth is violently shaken. For we have transgressed its laws. And let us include the need for an ecological balance of different cultures, traditions, and histories in our list of things that constitute a healthy planet as well. For when humanity is out of balance with itself, the Earth's people shake violently. And our responsibility for caring for creation is not over. Way back when I was in high school, Marvin Gaye had a song, Mercy Me, The Ecology. Things ain't what they used to be. Where did all the blue skies go? Poison is the wind that blows from the north and south and east. Oh, mercy, mercy me. Things ain't what they used to be or wasted on the oceans and upon our seas fish full of mercury, radiation underground and in the sky, animals and birds who live nearby are dying. Things ain't what they used to be. And what about this overcrowded land? How much more abuse from man can she stand? So beloved, as followers of Christ, as followers of one who led a spiritual movement who, with the lived sensibility of a fisherman, someone who lived off of the earth, Jesus was one who understood the water currents, who understood reading the sky, whose respect and understanding of nature made living possible. We who follow that Jesus should be leading the fight to improve the ecology 
and the ecological performance of our government, of our industries, of our local people. God has given us great honor and a charge. She has crowned us with glory and honor, setting us over all the works of her hands. And we have to ask God's forgiveness and patience with us as we endeavor to walk the talk. But I want to give you some good news. <laughs> the good news is that as part of the United Church of Christ, we stand as faithful witness on behalf of creation. Did you know that UCC, UCC ministers coined the phrase environmental racism? and played a leading role in giving birth to the environmental justice movement in the 1980s. Did you know that every stand for the environment that has taken place in places like Flint and Standing Rock, the United Church of Christ has been actively involved in standing alongside those communities. So you should be proud that we stand in a tradition, we stand in a denomination that takes the stewardship of the earth so seriously. We should be proud this day, for we belong to a committed group of Christians who believe in a still speaking God, who believes science compels us to understand the connection between the magnificence of creation and environmental degradation and social injustice. Here, in this church, we believe that we are to be the servants of creation. And that begins with seeing ourselves as holy partners on this human path as brothers and sisters. And we have the vision, and we have the knowledge, and we have the faith. We have purpose, and we have imagination. And because we serve a God of grace who gives us a new chance every day to try to get it right, God's will can be done if we have the will to do it and ask God for the strength to get through it. Standing firm knowing we can love and care for the earth as part of our faith witness because, oh Lord, how majestic is your name. So if you were here and without a church home and want to be part of this crazy group of people that believe that our faith can make a difference in this world, come talk to me after church. Amen.